um, we are ready now to take our page that we started to develop for a template for a site about me and um, really control the layout and, and make the layout match the wireframe that we said we were going to have. I um, want to take a second to review where we are and then go and, and build the template. Um, the task at hand was to, for us to, to learn more about CSS so that we can control the layout of the page. And to that end, what we wanted to achieve was to create a wireframe or to create pages that matched our wireframe. And our wireframe looked like this, where we had a banner on the top, our navigation on the side, and a content area over here, all right? And in order to do that, we have to take control over the positioning of these things. And we learned one way to take control last time, and that's via what's called absolute positioning. Um, jokingly, sometimes these are called frozen or ice pages because everything is sort of locked into place. And it's probably the simplest to implement. So uh, if you're getting started on any of these projects and you want to play around with it, the, the fixed layout is probably the simplest to implement and probably will have the least browser compatibility issues. That being said, the big disadvantage is it's not flexible for the users as, uh, and it's not as responsive to different sizes of screens and, and so on. But at any rate, um, the HTML that we came up with look like this for our template, where we have three main sections, the banner, the navigation, and the content area. The content area, I have what I've termed Greek text, or what is termed Greek text, which is just sort of a placeholder for the real content, because, you know, the assumption is at this point we're just making the template, so we, you know, we just want to put something in there to fill up the space so that we can see how it, how it lays out. And if we look at the HTML for this, we see that we have three divs. A div for the banner, a div for the navigation, and a div for the content. Remember, all a div is is div stands for division or section of a page. All right? So uh, all it is is a section of a page that we want to treat as a unit. All right? And therefore, we want to apply a style to it. We want to position it. Um, we want to treat that section of the page as a unit. So for example, um, if we look at our navigation div, the, that unordered list with those links, we want to treat as a unit. So whatever we do to it, we want to do to the whole thing. We're not going to do something to one part and not to the other. Likewise, this banner consists of this H1 and this H2. So we're going to treat that as, as a logical unit. And the logical structure of a page is put in HTML. The actual physical layout we control via CSS. So that's the start of our template. We then played around with another, uh, another page to learn the CSS box model, all right, where we took a couple of different divs and we styled them differently and we positioned them. And the CSS for that involved us giving a background color, which is kind of old news. But some of the new stuff, we gave it a width, we gave it a padding, we gave it a border, margin, and then we gave top and left positions to the different um, elements of the page. We sort of did the cascading part of cascading style sheets. That is, these divs have IDs, which means that if you use a pound sign in front of the rule, in front of the selector, that means apply this rule to things that have this as an ID. So things that have an ID of content one, get this rule. Things that have an ID of content two, get this rule. But they're also divs, so it will also get the rule applied for the divs. And again, that's a cascading part of the cascading style sheets, is that these are divs that have an ID of content one and content two. Therefore, they get both the style rule for the div and the style rule for their respective IDs. 
because the ID is more specific, that one will overrule any styles that are on the div. But if they're for different attributes, then they could get all their attributes, you know, some from the div, some from that. Notice in this example, I'm building my style sheet code right in my HTML page. Don't misunderstand to think that that's how it should end up. This is only sort of an intermediary step. This is, um, this is uh, just sort of a, a uh, it's just more convenient to edit everything on one page while I'm working through and figuring it out and trying to explain to you what I'm doing. So ultimately, we will take that style code and extract it to an external CSS file. So everything you do from the time we learned it on should be done via a C, uh, an external CSS file. We're just, again, just for uh, convenience and, and for the ease of being able to point back and forth, I'm using, uh, 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 using the uh, internal style sheet. All right. So let's go and take the lessons that we learned about the box model and apply them to the, um, to the template that we're developing. All right. The first thing I want to do with each of these divs is I want to give them each an ID. All right. The ID is what will allow us to refer to that div specifically. So. I'm going to give this one an ID of banner, because that's sort of the banner of the page. I'm going to give this an ID of navigation, or nav. And I'm going to give, give this the ID of content. Remember, our idea here is to get an HTML file that contains all the stuff that all our pages are going to have in common. right? All our pages are going to have a banner. All our pages are going to have a navigation. And all of them are going to have an area for content. Now, the specific content is going to be different on each page. But they're all going to have an area for content. So that's why we have that content div that currently has just placeholder text. But um, we can go and uh, uh, at any point um, you know, put the actual text in when we start cloning these. All right. So let's start building our style rules for these things. And we'll take it a div at a time. And I'm going to start out with the banner div. And I'm going to make the banner. I'm going to give it a width of 600 pixels. I'm going to give it a height of 150 pixels. I'm going to give it a top of 0 pixels, a left of 0 pixels, position, absolute, um, and then I'm going to give it um, a certain color scheme. I'll give this a background of red and a, te and a text color of white. Oftentimes, when I'm just sort of roughing out the page, I'll use very vivid colors so it's obvious. So I don't have to like look and guess, gee, you know, what shade of gray is that? You know. So even though I might not ultimately want my page to have a big, bold red banner on it, all right, um, I may start out having the banner being red just so that I can see exactly where the banner section is. That's a good debugging tool, by the way. If you're working on your CSS and it's not ending up the way that you want it to, give background colors to the different things and give much different background colors so that it will be visually obvious what's going on. All right. So we'll save this and refresh it. All right. 
And there is our banner. Now notice right now, it sort of overlapped the other stuff. The navigation and the content is underneath it. That's because we've started playing around with the position of the divs. Remember that the way your page looks is a combination of the CSS rules that are in effect and the default behavior of the browser. Now the default behavior of the browser is simply to put one div on top of the previous one or one div underneath the previous one, I guess is probably a better way to put it. All right. So there's sort of a flow. There's sort of the flow layout that starts at the top and puts it down. We've altered that flow by putting in our own positioning for one of the divs. So that's why it put this div in that position. <coughs> Excuse me. However, for the other divs, because we have not said anything about it, it still keeps them in that normal flow. And that's why, unfortunately, right now, that code is behind this div. So when we fix the position of those other divs, um, we'll be able to see them again. All right. Let's then go and position our navigation. And I'm going to give it a width of... 200, a height of 300 pixels, a top of, well, we can rough this out, right? You could spend time planning it out or you can just sort of, um, you know, um, work your way through it. If this one starts at position zero and has a height of 150, we don't want to make the top of this any less than 150, right? Because if it was, it would overlap again. So I'm going to give a little bit of wiggle room in here, and I'm going to put in a top of 160 pixels. And I'm going to give a left of 0 pixels. And again, I'll give it some vivid colors so I can clearly see where that div is. Save it. And now we have this. All right. Again, we have not positioned that content div, so it just goes in the normal flow, which, since it's the only unpositioned div, is the top of the page. So we will, uh, our next task will be to give a position to that div. All right, which I'll go in and do now by saying pound sign content, and I'm going to just copy this as a starting point. Uh, I want to make the width of this maybe something like 400. Height, maybe something like 400. Top, I want this top to line up with the top of the navigation, right? If we remember our wireframe. You can't tell it from this drawing, but these two things are supposed to line up on the top. So I'll give this the same top as the navigation. The left, though, if the navigation is at zero, and this is, what I say, 200 width, I better make the left of that guy at least 200. All right, otherwise it will overlap. So for good measure, I'll make it 210. Position absolute, background color, well, let's make a background color of blue. and a text color of red. All right. So we've essentially gotten the bare basics of our wireframe laid out. 
again, the colors are ugly, but I deliberately did that so we could clearly see what is, is what div. All right. We want to do a few things here because obviously we don't want to leave those colors. All right. So let's go and let's find some better colors and, and we'll use a, a, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the color tools that uh, we have available. But there's a few other things that we can do as well. So we'll first set the colors right to make this look good and then we'll go in and we'll make some of the other changes. So let me go in and I'll look for HTML color generator. I want that one. And I can go and I can pick the kind of style that I want. Do I want monochromatic, where it'll all be basically same color but different shades of it? Complementary, triad, tetrad, and so on. I, I usually stick with monochromatic just because, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm boring, all right? And I generally prefer, you know, to just have different shades of the same color as opposed to different. But again, you know. Your mileage may vary. Um, let's see. It's getting to be fall. So let's go with a fall sort of theme. And let's play around. Let's, hey, I like that one. All right. Hey, there you go. So let's go with that one. And if you, we go and click on the color list, we can see the actual code for the color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start applying these colors to uh, my page. The ironic thing of this page, by the way, is even though it's a great tool for color generator, the actual colors it itself uses isn't very good. Like, for example, you know, even at the screen, I'm straining to read this color because the, the color uh, up against the background is kind of hard to read. But, all right, there we go. I'm going to make the page, I'm going to make the body of the page have this color. So I'm going to go into my CSS, and I'm going to apply a rule for the body and say the page has a background of that. Um, for my banner, I'm going to make this the background. And I'll leave the text color white. Remember, in addition to these colors, you know, black, white, and gray are always sort of fair game as far as contrasting colors. So um, in a way, I don't even really count those when I say, you know, use two, three, four colors on your page. White and black sort of get a, a free pass. They, those don't really, really count uh, against your total. All right, I'll make this the navigation, the background of the navigation, and we'll make this the text color of the navigation. Um, we'll make this the content area. And yet, let's use black text here. I have no idea how this is going to turn out. I'm just trusting the fact that given the color picker seems to know what it's doing and it picked these colors, that it's going to be good. Uh, when, we, when we go and actually view it, we might not like it and we can tweak it a little bit. So let's go in and save this and refresh. Not bad. All right. A couple things I still don't like about it, and a couple things that we can we can look to change. All right. First of all, I definitely did not like the color of those links. You know, here we have a nice orangey kind of 
color scheme and the links are blue. All right. Why are the links blue? Why aren't the links the color that we specified? Well, again, remember your page is a combination of the default that the browser has plus your CSS code. And it's, it's a mix of those two. Uh, now, the good news is you can always trump the browser defaults with your CSS code. And in this case, this browser is defined to make links by default blue and underlined. So we can go and we can change our links not to be blue and underlined if we want. This, by the way, um, and I, I don't, don't think I took off for it on any assignments, but this was a problem in a lot of folks like labs uh, three and four, I, I think, maybe even lab two. Whereas they had a nice color scheme going, but they didn't set the rule for the way links should look, and therefore links were at a default blue. So they might have a nice default dark blue color scheme, and here they have blue links up against the dark blue background and made, made the links very hard to read. All right. So let's go in. Now, here's another trick with selectors. We can combine IDs and HTML tags this way. So for example, I can say pound sign nav A. All right. And what do you think that selector means? It means any A tag within the ID of nav. So in this case, this is the ID of nav. Any A tag within that will get this style. That way, we could have our links look a little bit different depending on the section of the page. You know, I might want a link that appears here look different than a link that appears here for whatever reason, in which case I can supply a different style rule and say the links over in this section get one color, the links over here get another color. So let's go in and do that, and let's pick a color of black. I'm going to remove the underline too. Text decoration none. Um, font size fourteen PX. Make it eighteen PX. Let's make them maybe a little bigger than normal. All right. So now those links aren't blue, but they look better up against that. Let's actually try make well, yeah, let's make them white. That might appear better still. Yeah, there I like that. Now I would say that it's pretty clear that these are links just based on their positioning. You know, people are used to seeing websites that have navigation over there. I mean, that's a pretty common sort of design. Um, what you can do, though, is you can actually add what are called pseudo classes to your links. And what are pseudo classes? Pseudo classes are different behavior depending on whether that link's visited or not, whether your mouse is on the link or not, and so on. So, let's Google this because I never remember it.
Um, this specifies the best order to put these in. Link, that's an unvisited link. Visited is a visited link. Oftentimes you want to give a visited link a different appearance just to let the user know that they've been there. Um, hover and active. So I'm going to go and I'm going to say a link gets this style. A visited gets the color of black. Now here's where we can have some fun. We can specify a different style rule when the mouse is hovering over the link, that is when the user is pointing at it. That's another good little visual indication that, hey, you're looking at a link. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to make it be a little bigger. And I'm going to give it a weight of bold, not blood, bold. All right. Now notice what happens when I put my mouse over it. The link gets a little bigger. That sort of gives the... <coughs> Excuse me. That gives the user another indication that they're looking at a link. We can actually change the color if we want. I can do something like this. Let's invert the foreground and background color. Ooh, now we're having fun. So as we put our mouse over that, not only does the size of it change, but it actually flips the foreground and background color, which is, an, again, a nice little visual cue that, hey, you're dealing with a link here. That is an ordinary text. All right. You can do all sorts of things. You could put a border on it, you know, when the mouse is hovered on it. All right. So really, um, anything you can do in CSS, you could do here and, and make it give it an effect. You could swap background images. You could actually make it look like a button by giving a different background image, you know, when, when the mouse is hovering it. A lot of flexibility. All right. I'm not really big on those bullet points, so let's remove those. Now, you might ask yourself, how do you know all these different things? You know, I know them because I've done them a million times, all right? But for those things that I've only done like maybe 900,000 times, on occasion, I still need to look those up. And that's where I go to, again, W3 schools. And for example, if today, let's say, was a bad day because, you know, my daughter's alarm was set for 6 p.m. instead of 6 a.m., and therefore she didn't wake up on time and therefore she had to rush to get to school and I had to rush to get her to school and therefore I didn't really have time to get ready. This is just a hypothetical situation, by the way. All right. Uh, then I could look up on W3 schools styling lists and I could determine, gee, how do I style lists? And as you look through here, 
there's a list style type attribute and you can actually make the list style type for a list none. So I can say pound sign nav ul list style type none. I guess my point is, is that, you know, you're never going to memorize all these different style rules and all these different attributes and properties and values and so on. You'll, you'll remember the ones that you use a lot. But there will always be the case where you need to go and look them up. What you should know, though, is the way that styles work. And again, remember, styles have a selector that says what gets this rule. The rule then is defined in within the braces and it consists of an attribute, a colon, and the value for that attribute. So the style rules come uh, in, in with these pairs. Property name or attribute name, colon, value. So with 600, then a semicolon, height 150, and so on. So far, we've seen three kinds of selectors. We've seen a basic HTML selector where any HTML tag gets that rule. We've seen an ID based selector where the thing on the page that has that ID gets that rule. And we've seen a mix of the HTML and the ID, whereas any unordered list within the navigation section gets this rule. So if I were to have another unordered list elsewhere on the page, it would not get that style rule. And I could write, if I wanted to, I could write my own style rule for that. This is assuming, of course, I want them to be different. If I didn't care and I wanted them all to be the same, then I wouldn't put the ID name out in front. All right, so that one still has the bullet point. Why? Because that's not in the nav section. But this doesn't. Questions. Learning the different properties and their values is really just a matter of time. The basic idea of CSS is fairly simple. You have a selector and then you have a set of rules. Now those selectors, as we've seen, can get more complicated uh, than the basic ones that we looked at the first, uh, first uh, examples in class. But it's still a selector, and the selector's job is to point to the things on the page that get that style rule. And then the style rule consists of some property, some aspect of that, and the value that we want to give it. All right, we could probably play around with this more. I mean, we obviously could play around with this tons if we wanted to. All right. Um, we could, for example, center this. Uh, a lot of folks have been saying, you know, gee, um, I, I, you know, I, I want that center, so I'm going to use the center tag. And invariably, I've, I've noted, don't use the center tag or avoid using it. We'll learn how to do it in CSS. Well, that's what we're going to do now. We're going to learn how to do it in CSS. If I want to center some content, I can just say text align center. So if I want to center the stuff that's in the banner, I can add to the style rule text align colon center. And what that will do is that will center the text that's in there. Now why do I say that that's a better way to do it? Well again, if you put the center tag in your HTML code, that's in your HTML code. When I start cloning these pages, which we probably will get to today, all right, that center tag will be in every single HTML page. 
Which means if I decide I no longer want it centered, but I want it left aligned, right aligned, whatever, I have to go through each one of those HTML pages and change the center tag. All right, get rid of it. In this case, though, I don't have to do anything to the HTML. I just go to the one CSS file and make the change, and all the pages that use that CSS file are affected. Now, again, you know, this is a case you could go all day, you know, changing this. But the one, I, I want to go over two other things because these are, um, well, the one thing is, is something I've mentioned, I've told people not to do. The other thing is uh, something that, again, you can really, I think, bump up the appearance of your page if you do this. The first thing is, is the uh, padding. Notice how this goes right up against the edge. That doesn't really look good in my mind. It would be better if we put a little bit of padding on that content area. So I'll say padding 5px. That puts a little bit of padding around it. And that, in my mind, makes it a lot more readable and makes it look a lot nicer. All right. The other thing is the break tag, the BR tag. A lot of people, if they've wanted to put extra space between stuff, they've used a break tag. All right. So if they wanted more space between those links, they would do something like this. because that's a list item. Let's try putting it between the list items. This is probably illegal, by the way, but... Yeah. Yeah. The, I, I would expect the FBI to be here any minute. Because I have something inside a list that's not inside a list item, right? A list is a, is a series of list items. So therefore, anything inside the list should be inside a list item. Okay. And this BR is outside a list item. But I've had a lot of students that do that because they want extra space between items, either on a list or even not on a list. And I've told them, don't use the BR. Why? Same reason. In a minute here, I'm going to start cloning these pages. That is, I'm going to start making copies of these. If I decide at some point that I don't want those extra spaces, there's five pages I'm going to have to change. All right? And that's extra work. If instead I don't do that and I get rid of these break tags, I can do this. I can specify that within my nav section, any li, I want to have a margin on the bottom of 10 pixels. Now, we'll talk more about these margins and margin bottom and margin top. You can specify one margin and it will work in all four directions. Top, right, bottom, left. Or you can specify margin, dash, top, bottom, right, and left. And it will only apply in that one direction. At any rate, if I go and do this then, I can go in and I can create the same effect that I did with the break tag, but in a much more flexible way. It's all about flexibility, all right? We're putting this CSS in an external file and we're having all our pages point to it. 
What's the real reason for that? Because then any change we make to that page, I'm sorry, to that file, will get reflected automatically in all my pages. All right. So now I'm ready to extract my CSS file, put it in its own, uh, put it in its own file. All right, and then start cloning these and making the individual pages from this template. All right. I think I'm going to stay after class, by the way, for when these people's class is going on, and we can talk real loud during during their class, all right? I, I don't know if you folks can hear or not, but it's real distracting for me, all right? Uh, at any rate, I'm going to go and I'm going to break this out, so I'm going to go and cut this. Make a new file, paste it in, and I will save it as file.css. I will then change this page, my template, to point to that page link rel equals style sheet type equals tech slash css href equals style dot css and if I did that right It's still going to work the way it did before. The advantage is now it points to that external style sheet. Now we can start cloning this guy, and we can start making our individual pages that um, that um, correspond to the, the the links that I've defined for this. So I can go in here, and I can copy this and make my home page, which I've called index. and bio, and hobbies, and links. I think that was my four names. And then I can go into these, and I am just going to go in and put a little bit of text indicating that this is my home page. And I'll put the word bio on the biography page. And I will put the pay the word hobby on the hobbies page. And I'll put the word links on the links page. So now, here's my home page. All right? And I just put the word home page there, right? I don't, uh, I don't, uh, you know, in a real page, uh, in a real page would put more, would put the actual content for the page there, all right? But again, in the interest of time, I'm just going to do this. Why is that now a black link instead of a white link? Because I visited that page. And notice as I move from page to page to page, 
those links are going to turn black to indicate that I have visited them. Now, if I don't like something about the appearance of the page, for example, notice how that doesn't line up exactly with that. Probably because of padding and all that, you know, I'm probably a few pixels off. I can just go into the CSS file and yeah, I think I'm about 20 pixels off, so I'll go and change that. I don't really like the color of the body. Let's change the color of the body to just plain white. And there. Now my page looks like that. And not just that one page, but every page looks like that. So anything I do to that one CSS page will be reflected in every page that I've created, all right? which is a great thing, great in terms of maintenance. So for example, if we would have done that with the break tag, all right, I now have four pages. And if I decided I wanted to eliminate those spaces, I would have to go into four pages and eliminate the BR tag. Here, with CSS code, I don't have to eliminate that. I can so just go and eliminate the margin between the list items. There, everything is back on top of each other. Or if I want a bigger space between them, I can go and add that in as well. And there I have a big space in between them. And again, not just on this page, but on every page. That's why it's so important to keep the separation of your content and the way that it looks. And anything that relates to the way that it looks ought to be in your CSS file. So I can change the spacing between the links without touching the HTML. I can change the alignment. What if I want this aligned to the right now? I can go in and simply say text align right. Put a little padding in here. Yeah. Our padding messed up the top of those. Let's bump those down a little bit. But the nice thing is, is if it doesn't, you know, if we have to make a change, if we have to make a correction, we only have to do that in one place. And every page will get that change. So remember, your HTML you're going to clone. So you should take as much care as you can to make sure that the stuff that's going to be common on every page, you've nailed and you've gotten right. All right? Because once you start cloning that, you're going to have to deal with multiple copies of it. So if I decided I wanted a different line in my header, well, I'm out of luck. I ha there's nothing else I can do. If I wanted to put Michael Zellers instead of Mike, because that HTML code got cloned, I have to change it in all four places. All right? There's no way just using HTML without using some sort of server-side technology that we can address that. We just have to deal with that. So you do your best to make sure that that's correct. Your style stuff, if you've done a good job separating the content from the appearance, all right, and everything about the appearance is in a CSS file, then you can just go in and change that single CSS file, and every page gets that change. All right? We'll build on this next week because there's some more things that we want to do, and there's different styles. Uh, that we can do. Notice, for example, that this page doesn't budge regardless of how big the window size is. That's why I described this kind of layout at the beginning of class as a frozen layout or an ice layout. It's stuck at that size. 
All right. Is that good or bad? Well, I don't know. But it's an observation. And it's something that you should deliberately make the decision you want it to be that way uh, after exploring what some of the other options are. All right. We'll see you up in lab then.